Good morning. This is Wendy Smith, and I am thrilled to have you all here today for our fifth in our Leadership in Times of Crisis webinar series. Um, I am the co-founder and academic director of the Women's Leadership Initiative at the University of Delaware, and we are thrilled to be putting on this series and have you all here and join us together. Before I get started, I just wanna say that this series has grown significantly over time and we are honored and thrilled to have um, some great sponsors who are helping make sure that we can continue to bring this content to you. So thank you to the Delaware Business Times, to Wawa, to Delaware Prosperity Partnership. We as an initiative look forward to continuing to provide this kind of content for a growing community across Delaware and really we have people signing in across the world. So we hope that this content continues to be relevant and invite anyone who is interested, either you or your company to be in touch with us if you wanna help us and continue to sponsor this work. This is, as I said, our fifth in a series. We are looking forward to our final uh, in this particular series where we will talk about resilience, something that I know we all need to think about as um, we become more and more aware that this is not a short term crisis that we are managing, but that as we've dealt with the initial crisis of COVID, there's gonna be a long tail for us to navigate going forward. So please do join us for our final session two weeks from now. And I know many of you have been with us for the series and if you've missed any of them, uh, we have posted the videos from, the, from each of our previous sessions, each of our previous webinars online. So feel free to uh, jump in and uh, access this. It's on our uh, website and the recordings are there and you can have access to that. I wanna just say one thing. I know that we are all uh, Zoomed out, that as my colleague Amy Stengel has noted, Zoom has become the, the generic word for video conferencing. And again, for those of you who haven't been with us, we are now using Zoom webinar, which different from the Zoom meeting means that you can't turn on your video or your audio. And yet we very much wanna be interactive with you in this conversation. So we welcome you to be using the chat to add your comments, to connect with one another in this community, to add your questions. We will try and get through or get to as many questions as possible today. And certainly to add additional resources. What our team has done in the past is that we will uh, collate those resources. We will uh, get them out to this group sometime this afternoon so that you can continue in interacting with one another and learning from one another, not just learning from us and our speakers. So please do feel uh, welcome. We hope that you will use the chat liberally to engage with one another. Finally, those of you that joined us a couple minutes early, we put up some music. We have a Spotify playlist for our group that is interactive and we hope that you jump on and uh, join us for some inspiration at a moment that I think we all need it. So if you are interested in uh, joining this playlist, just send us an email at women's leadership, which is women's leadership at ud.edu. I am particularly excited about today's conversation. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to just start with acknowledging why and what this conversation is about. As I looked back through our series, I noticed or one thread that has really run through the whole series is what I think of as navigating uncertainty. So crises open up or introduce to us a tremendous sense of I don't know what the future looks like, a tremendous sense of uncertainty, and uh, that leads to a lot of anxiety. And one of the things that we are trying to do collectively is navigate how to manage that anxiety. And so across the series, we've really dealt with topics to manage that uncertainty and anxiety, both to deal with how to stay grounded amidst that anxiety, how to find uh, both and solutions to address the uncertainty going forward, how to navigate the conflicts that come up amidst that uncertainty. And one of the things that we know is that uncertainty creates both 
opportunity to innovate, the chance to really do something new, but it also creates a certain anxiety about where novelty, uh, wh where the future will go, what the future will look like, because what we know is change is inevitable and the future, and particularly amidst this really significant environmental jolt, will look significantly different than what our current moment looks like. So even before I introduce our speakers, I just wanna take a pulse of this group. So those of you who are joining us, uh, be ready. I'm gonna share a poll and I wanna just invite our conversation uh, or invite your input, which is how you're feeling, where you are in terms of engaging with what the future looks like and what the possibilities of novelty look like for you. So I'm gonna, on your screens, you should see a poll that says, when I think about change that lays ahead for me and or for my company, my organization, how am I feeling? So I wanna invite you to uh, jump in on the poll and I'll leave it open for a couple of minutes so that we can gauge where we're all at in thinking about this possibility of the future, but also uncertainty about the future. Great, so here is what we see. Uh, and what we're seeing is that many people are both excited and energized. Uh, while some people are feeling scared, worried, or disconnected, there is this enthusiasm of what might happen going forward. And hopefully what we can do in today's session is really address that possibility of how we can form and um, maybe take advantage of, capture, value that excitement going forward. With that, I am excited to share our speaker today. I wanna to just start by saying that unfortunately, um, Ella Marone Spector was called away with a family emergency. And while all is fine on her end, it meant that she can't join us this morning. So Ella sends her regrets. Uh, I hope and I look forward, or I don't just hope, but I really look forward to the chance where we in the Women's Leadership Initiative will re-engage with her ideas. And uh, as a co-author of mine and someone who I've done some significant work with, I'll look forward to sharing some of her ideas as well as in our follow-up email to all of you this afternoon, we'll put some of the resources of some of her work. But with that, I am thrilled uh, to introduce Michael Tushman, uh, who is professor at Harvard Business School. The, uh, I'll just read this out in its impressive nature. The Baker Foundation Professor Paul R. Lawrence, Class of 1942 Professor Emeritus, Charles Thornton, Faculty Chair of the Advanced Management Program. Uh, Mike has over his career been studying innovation and change and has brought forth some incredibly significant ideas that have not only tremendously influenced academia and how we think about in innovation and change. They have also tremendously influenced some Fortune 100 companies to think about the practices that they use at a corporate level to navigate change and enable innovation. I will also say on a personal level, Mike Tushman has influenced me and my own thinking significantly. Um, I like to say that I grew up academically learning from Mike as my own doctoral advisor. And so, Mike, I am so thrilled to have you here to be in conversation with you this morning. What I will do is stop here, turn this over to Mike, who will share some ideas about how we innovate, how organizations can innovate, and therefore what we can learn from that as individuals to take advantage of that excitement or that energy and think about what the new normal will look like going forward. So, Mike, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Hey, Wendy, so thrilling to be working uh, with Wendy uh, and the Women's uh, Initiative at the University of Delaware. Um, and I'm sorry that Ella can't join us, so Wendy and I will work as a tag team with you uh, this morning. Um, I work, as Wendy said, uh, on the topic of innovation, leadership, and change. And I want to engage you in that discussion. And I'm going to go for maybe 15 minutes. Um, so get my timing straight, um, and then we'll take some uh, questions and we'll interact uh, together. Um, just a few months ago, we were in this sort of happy world of leadership, innovation, and change, the role of firms and societies, the role of digital AI on the firm, and that has all of a sudden shifted 
in this world of COVID. Um, I want to talk about my work on innovation, the research on innovation uh, and leadership in this COVID world, in the post-COVID world. Uh, and I want to build on work I've been doing for a whole lot of years with my friend and colleague, Charles O'Reilly. Uh, Charles is at Stanford. He and I have been collaborating over the years, uh, both together uh, and with our doctoral students on a point of view on innovation, leadership, and change. And I'm going to be sort of walking through some of these ideas uh, that we have been engaged with in the field uh, and in firms. And I know some of my colleagues from Change Logic are here. We are actually working in organizations and learning from organizations on how they deal with uh, leadership challenges in the pre-COVID world, in the COVID world, and in the post-COVID world. So a couple of basic ideas that uh, are foundational to uh, my work uh, on innovation. This is, this is work I've done with Wendy. So everything I'm talking about here um, is with uh, Wendy Smith. Um, we talk about strategy, uh, insight, and execution. On the left-hand side of this picture is the work you do as strategists, this notion of innovation streams I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, and this notion of being close to your clients, close to your customers, and some notion of strategic, strategic intent or competitive vision, everybody. I'm going to talk a lot about this notion of identity, and I'm going to actually raise this notion, uh, and I'm going to actually ask you to think about identity, the identity, not so much your identity, but the identity of the firm as crucial in this pandemic we're facing and in post-pandemic world. And I'll define what I mean by that in a second. So on the left hand side of this picture is sort of strategy and aspiration and identity and the right hand side is pure execution. This work was done many years ago with Dave Nadler and then uh, Charles uh, and I picked it up further, worked on it with our students, uh, Wendy among them. So one notion of organizational architecture, both the hardware of a firm that is the processes and structure and the software of the firm together aligned to execute the strategy. That's like a happy old fashioned thought. One of the basic ideas that Wendy and I had, oh, back when she was a doctoral student, um, just a few years ago, Wendy, uh, was this notion of you cannot get to the future just by doing what you're doing now, what you've done in the past. It's a basic idea from Jim March, uh, distinguished organizational sociologist from Stanford, on dynamic capabilities are rooted in exploiting what you're currently doing and simultaneously exploring into new spaces. And this dynamic of explore and exploit are at the roots of dynamic capabilities. The problem is that the architectures required to exploit are different and inconsistent with the architectures required to explore. That's where Wendy and Charles and I have talked about this notion of structural ambidexterity. Our way of dealing with the challenges of explore and exploit, or we call innovation streams, is simultaneously building architectures that are internally inconsistent. Some of the architectures focused on exploit, some of them on explore. More recently, we've been talking about ideation, incubation, and scaling. It's the same basic notion building in multiple architectures to both explore and exploit. I'm gonna be giving you a bunch of examples today. I'm gonna to talk about Moleskin. Uh, you might remember Moleskin as the notebook company and their challenge of going digital. I'm gonna talk about Denver Public Schools, this work I did in De All the examples I'm talking about, by the way, are examples where we've written cases so I can be very public about it. Denver Public Schools or any public school having to deal with old fashioned teaching and web mediated teaching. Um, I'm gonna talk about the growth of Lululemon um, and I'm gonna talk about NASA, one of my doctoral students, uh, Hila uh, Lifshitz did work, magnificent work on research at NASA, the old fashioned way of doing research and a completely different way of doing research based on the crowd. All I wanna say is those are all examples of explore and exploit and doing that simultaneously and again, whether you're the CEO of DuPont or middle level manager of a, a bank in Delaware, you all have this challenge of exploring exploit. I am a middle, while I'm a senior faculty at the Harvard Business School, 
I'm also a middle level manager. I run one of the programs and I have this challenge of building the advanced management program. So it's better than ever as a residential on campus program and exploring into digital online delivery of content. That is an end by dexterity challenge for me personally as a middle level manager. And Charles and I and Wendy, a bunch of us have talked about uh, this notion of structural and by dexterity. Let me just define it. It's high differentiation, separating the past from the future, separating profitable from unprofitable, um, separating small from large, powerful from not powerful, high differentiation, targeted integration with the stuff to leverage. So at HBS, the last thing the Dean wants to do is spin off Harvard Business School Online because we're gonna leverage faculty research. High differentiation, targeted integration with the stuff to leverage. And again, if there's nothing to leverage everybody, you spin it out. And the third thing, and I'll spend most of my time on this, is really strong senior team integration. Our work in organizations, our work at ChangeLogic is partly on structure. I believe that is pretty straightforward. There's nothing magical about an ambidextrous structure. There's nothing magical, magic about targeted integration, There's nothing difficult about targeted integration. The issue is building teams that can deal with paradox, that can deal with inconsistency, uh, and can deal with conflict. And that's been central to uh, Wendy's research stream. Uh, she will talk about this paradoxical mindset that Ella was going to talk about. She will talk about her work on digital data divide, for example, where senior teams do that. Wendy's probably the world's greatest expert on senior teams and paradox. Uh, what I want to do in my few minutes with you uh, this morning is talk about this notion of identity. My current work is around pushing my strategy colleagues and my clients to think about the firm's identity as relatively more important than its strategy. It's not that strategy is not important. What I mean to say is, yeah, strategy is important, explore and exploit. The specifics of explore and exploit, the sp specifics of ideation, incubation, and scaling. But what I want to suggest now is overarching that, the foundation of being able to live into paradox is your ability as a senior leader or as a middle-level manager to articulate a clear, emotionally engaging identity. Um, I first bumped into this um, when I interviewed this fellow who was the head of the Ball Corporation, who was able to explore and exploit over time. This is maybe 15 years ago. Um, and he had this notion of we're here. No, uh, the Ball Corporation, uh, uh, we want to be the world's greatest container corporation. And that identity of containment as opposed to glass or metal or plastic permitted them to explore and exploit. So I'm going to ask you to think about pure passion here, your ability to articulate an overarching aspiration, overarching identity that permits explore and exploit to go on simultaneously. And by the way, I believe that in this world of COVID, this is super important. Let me be really specific and introduce you to Sandy uh, Fenwick. Sandy is the uh, CEO of Children's Hospital in Boston, the preeminent children's hospital in the world, five years straight. Listen to Sandy. We describe ourselves um, as an organization that is absolutely fundamentally committed to the care and the well being of children and their families. And our way of describing that internally and then to the world is using a phrase, until every child is well. That has been a way that we have really embedded and embodied in ourselves, sort of our true north, our north star. Why are we here? What's our purpose? What's our identity? And how do we get everybody to say, how do I have a role in participating in that goal? For me, passion has always been what drives me, why I came to a place like Children's. And that goal of making a statement about what we can do to improve the lives of children and their families. And so how you then take a passion and a purpose and an identity and think about 
how you weave strategy, how you weave the business requirements for being successful and for achieving that goal has to be really truly intertwined. People come with passion. They want to make a difference. They want to have impact. But they also need to understand that there's some hard, cold business components to that. We need revenue. We need resources to do our job every day, to perfect what we do today, but then also to reinvest, to explore, to innovate for the future. That takes very methodical business planning. How we're going to do it, how we're going to generate the resources, how we're going to be efficient, how we're going to become indispensable to people who want our services. And so thinking about strategy with that overlay of a goal of identity and purpose is really how we have talked about putting those two pieces together. We describe ourselves um, as an organization. Cindy, um, uh, that was Cindy Fenwick talking about um, identity, and I, I, I'd like to engage you in that. The, the, um, I'm just looking at my time. Uh, I've done some recent work on the role of the board, but I, let me just suggest, and more recent work with uh, Ryan, Raffaele, Marianne, uh, Glenn, and myself on the cognitive aperture of the senior team. And all I want to suggest right now, let me just stick with this, is that one of the sources of inertia in a firm is the senior team's strategic aperture narrows at these crises, like the pandemic. And what we're arguing is to broaden, having a senior team that can broaden the capability dimension of their firms, their organizations or these units, like me in AMP, to broaden their awareness of the competitive set. And believe me, for the advanced management program uh, at AMP, the old, our old competitive set of Stanford, Columbia, LBS, INSEAD, that's finished. It's those plus a completely different set of competitors in the advanced management uh, competitive space. And finally, this notion of some overarching identity. That's what we're working on now is building the senior team's capability of having this enlarged competitive set. Let me just finish with um, the role of leadership circa 2020. This is your time. This is where leaders must step up in this challenge. I think this notion of structural and by dexterity, senior teams, paradox and identity is really, really important now. And I look forward to taking your questions and helping you live into the challenge of exploring super efficiently uh, in this world where the fundamental strategy of your organizations have to change uh, in this COVID world. So let me uh, stop sharing and we'll go to uh, Wendy. Mike, I, I love it. And I also love that last slide, which reminds us how um, prevalent this possibility is. And I want to get to this idea of identity and passion and how it informs us and thinking about innovation. But before I do, I want to just take a step back. Um, one of the things that I know you've done is really look across in a, look at innovation across the ages. And right. I want to just start with sort of exploring. This is a massive what we call in academia an environmental jolt. Oh, this, yeah. this COVID is is requiring us. It's not like we ha have. You know, some of your work on ambidexterity says, even if we're not required externally to innovate, leaders need to do that. This is a world where the external world is requiring us to innovate. Like, are we in a totally new world or is this something we've seen before? And if we've seen this before, what do we know from our previous experiences that help us understand this moment? I, well, I, I do not think organizations and societies have seen this since, you know, the Spanish flu more than 100 years ago. Yeah. So I think we're in a completely different era. And it's an era, as you said, Wendy, where strategy has got to be completely reconceptualized. Yeah. We've got to figure out what it means to do banking. We have to figure out what it means to do space flight. We have to figure out what it means to do education. That the, the, the notion of learning really fast how to deal with a profoundly different space is super critical. That's why I think this 
impulse to explore has never been more important. Yeah. And the impulse to explore runs frequently orthogonal to where you have been. And so I think this notion of figuring out as a leader how you build an organization that can rapidly explore, even while you, got, even while you hold a fort in the short term, is really critical. Um, yeah. Charles and I, one more point, Charles and I have talked about performance gaps and opportunity gaps. I think COVID-19 represents a gigantic opportunity gap. For those firms that were doing well at a certain point in time, all of a sudden, if you don't move, this opportunity now will be a real performance gap really soon. Yeah. And that's a, opportunity gaps are really hard for incumbents to deal with. Yeah, right. Because your insight is sort of that the I irony is that when you are not performing, that pushes us to innovate. When oh. you are performing, we're stalled. Right. Right. And so here's a moment where people have been performing, but if they don't do something really right. quick, it's right. going to be a problem. Totally. Somebody in the chat said, you know, talk more about the explore, exploit continuum, right? And so explore is about looking to the future, which frankly is coming much faster right. at this moment than we ever expected. And exploit is about doing the, the past, really navigating what we've done in the past. Do you have a sense of how much, you know, this, and the idea, the paradoxical idea is you got to do both, right? You can't just pick between them and you got to live into both. What's your sense about how much we are in a moment of just pure transition? You know, you've talked about it as a punctuation. We've just got to change versus a moment where we really do have to take advantage of the past as we move into the future. Like, what's your sense of navigating that balance, that tension right. at this moment? Right. First of all, whoever had that chat about, I don't think it's a continuum, everybody. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's zero one. I think that exploit is completely different than explore. They're not ends of a continuum. They're just completely different. Yeah. Let me just speak personally. Again, I, I, I lead, I have the honor to be the faculty chair of the advanced management program. The largest, oldest, amazingly successful program for senior leaders. Seven weeks on campus, everybody. And it's magnificent. We will come back to that. Maybe in 18 months, I think we'll come back to that. But in the meantime, we've got to figure out online executive education. Yeah. That is a pressure that I feel as the leader and the Dean has to be in a world where he can permit me to rapidly experiment, even as I don't give up on seven weeks of face-to-face -face executive education. So that, that impulse to be able to build completely different architectures and to deal with a faculty team, whether it's at Harvard or a public school or an advertising agency or an automobile company, that challenge of doing both, I think is super underlined these days. Yeah, and by the way, the, the exploit, the existing world, the existing uh, advanced management program or the existing, you know, that world is gonna change in response to the innovation. So. Oh. So it, we're going to come back to it. We need to value those yeah. resources and recognize that that world is going to change as well. Totally. totally. Right? Again, as I think about what I do, it may well be that seven weeks on campus is finished. It may be yeah. post-pandemic. That strategy is no longer viable. Yeah. But you need to build, be living in an organization that can tolerate experimentation. That's all I'm saying. Is right now in this world of this punctuated change of COVID, in an amazing way, affecting every industry on the planet is requiring a reconsideration of what the heck is our strategy? What are these innovation streams and how do we build an architecture to do both? Yeah, and, but, but in that world, so like one, one sort of gut reaction, right? So what we know is that people like to have more certainty and being clear about whether we are exploiting, focusing on the past or explore, you know, the, the current or, or exploring, focusing on the future allows more certainty, living in both, is, is uncertain. So right. one sort of, you know, gut reaction, one tendency, one, one is to say, okay, look, we're just going to the future. Let's get rid of this exploit. And yet there's a reason to continue to exploit. Why? Like, can you unpack for us, like, why continue to look at what we've got as we, you know, and not just rip the bandaid or get on the bus the way Collins and Porus said, and just move to the future without you know, and, and say goodbye to the past. Like, why hold yeah, on great, to that great. paradox? Yeah. Let me talk about some work I did with Ahila Lifshitz, a doctoral student um, 
now at NYU. She did work at NASA. Um, and uh, life sciences at NASA. And the role of these life scientists at NASA were to keep astronauts, the world was doing research on health and humans in space. In this COVID world, Wendy, old fashioned research on heliophysics is not gonna go away. You, you still have to be a great heliophysicist. But in this world of both pre and post COVID where much of the research is being done in the crowd, you have to do research in a completely different way. Yeah. And so if you're Jeff Davis and Jeff, everybody is a middle level manager at NASA. He, he cannot give up on the past, you know, this fantastic research at NASA. Even as he figures out a completely different way of doing research. That's why I think your work and Hila's work on identity is so crucial yeah. because this is an example of both organizational identity at NASA and professional identity of these heliophysics. Her, 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 she really zoned in on heliophysicists. And the only way they were able to switch this mindset to do research the old fashioned way, the exploit way and the explorer way was when Jeff Davis was able to art Articulate, we're here to keep astronauts safe in space, not just to do research. We're here to keep astronauts safe in space. And that narrative permitted these uh, scientists to treat open, distributed peer innovation as a tool to keep astronauts safe in space. And so, so this, this, this living into uncertainty, which you've, you and Marianne have done like, this gigantic research on, um, is really important. That's why this identity thing is an anchor to that because it provides a narrative, it pr pr provides a hook that ha, I get why we, we live in this paradoxical, contradictory world. You know, I want to get to and unpack the idea of identity because on some level it's simple and on some level it's really complex. It's, it's sort of simple in its, its idea, but really complex in its implementation. But before I do, there's been, you know, I, I want to just stick with this idea of innovation streams, explore, exploit for a minute. There's some questions in the chat you know, give us some more examples of organizations that are really navigating explore and exploit at the same time. And again, for folks that aren't into March's work in the academic literature, explore meaning looking into the future, innovating, doing something new, exploit meaning continuing to do what we've always done and really valuing and developing that. I, I know you have tons of examples of that. So can, you know, before we move from that idea, a couple more, and, and, and to that, that's the sort of idea of it, being ambidextrous, being able to do both the, the today and tomorrow. Can you give us a couple more examples before we sure, 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 start sure. to unpack identity? Yeah. Let, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, we have a wonderful case that Ryan Raffaelli did on moleskin. And Maria Segrandini, uh, one of the founders, has this notion. And again, everybody, when I say exploit, I mean exploit your strategy. It's not yeah. exploiting your employees or exploit. It's exploit your strategy. Yeah. partly her agenda was we've got a notebook business that is magnificent. And by the way, at the time, you couldn't buy a moleskin notebook at a stationery store. You bought a, no a moleskin notebook at a bookstore because at that time, the identity of moleskin was a book yet to be written. Oh, what a neat idea that is. Yeah. Then comes digital. And the issue for Maria was, do we want to explore into this world of digital? And if, if the identity was a book yet to be written, the answer would have been no, Wendy. But she, what she did is she raised the aspiration. What moleskin is, is a place where creative people interact. Yeah. So now there are these moleskin cafes. There are these moleskin digital notebooks. They have this collaboration with a bunch of tech firms where you can get a moleskin notebook, but it's basically digital. That's a great example of ambidexterity, of holding on to notebooks, magnificent, and doing digital at the same time. Yeah. And her identity has shifted from a book yet to be written to a place where creatives get together or so, something like that. It's a more, more encompassing, more uh, overarching identity. Um, uh, this work at Cloudflare, this is a tech company uh, outside of San Francisco. Uh, this is on security. They've got this notion of high-end security and they play this explore and exploit game. The exploit game is done 
in the valley. And Matt Prince has this notion of when we want to explore, we physically move to Texas. We have a completely different architecture. And then by the way, he says, hey, then Texas is going to become exploited. And then we're going to move to Boise, where we're going to explore in Boise. So this, he's got a real mental model of how you do both. Let me give you one more example. Um, we have this magnificent case on Havas. Yeah. Havas is a French headquartered advertising agency, totally brilliant leader, David Jones. He sees the future and the future is old fashioned advertisement where the creatives are key and simultaneously as a compliment doing crowd-based content, crowd-based media. He does exploration through acquisition, Be beautiful strategy. The problem was high differentiation, check. Targeted linkage, check. But he could not get the senior team to embrace the old and the new. And what will happen, everybody, is if you do not have a senior team that will embrace the old and the new, the old always wins. And that's what happened to have us. The old creative leaders, the power brokers, squished the exploratory stuff. So, so that's an example of brilliant strategy, lousy execution. And at the end of the day, our work on ambidexterity hinges on senior leaders and the ability of senior leaders to live into paradox, to live into contradiction. And uh, our book, um, uh, Lead and Disrupt, and more recently, this California Management Review, Review article by Andy Bins and Charles, many, many, many more examples. Yeah, and I don't know if Andy Bins is on with us today, uh, but Andy, if, if you are here and on with us, you know, Andy has been significant in advancing this work. You yeah. know, I just want to um, reinforce one other thing, which you said initially, and I think is important, which is that in this world of doing both, explore, exploit today and tomorrow, a key is that there are resources that in your old world you bring forward, that you leverage, that you take right. advantage of. There's right. assets in that old world. And one of the things that I hear in the Moleskin example is that sometimes those resources are not so obvious or there's the role of the senior leader to figure out what is it that we've done. You know, so it may be that in academia, we go forward in a totally different way, maybe with expanding how we face the market and maybe it's it's new ways of thinking about students and maybe but what we think about is things like we have content and ideas how do we bring them forward how does moleskin not think about itself as a book but think about itself as you know advancing the generation of new ideas or what have you so that seems really important right like take either knowing you have those assets or being able to figure out what is it that i'm going to leverage and what i've done so that I can bring it into what I'm going to do. Yeah. That's our notion of broadening the competitive set, broadening yeah. the capabilities, and broadening the identity. And again, Moleskine's a beautiful example, and we have her on tape, is she's actually jacks up the identity to something that is much more abstract and much more broad than a book yet to be written that permits legitimate exploration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to go to this. Well, was there more? Yeah, but I do want to pick up on your notion of, yeah. you know, identity and it's complex. I actually think identity is not complex. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, I, I do not want the listeners in this seminar or the seminar series to say, oh man, this complexity is just for my boss's 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 boss. boss, boss, boss. Yeah. It's like super complex. I think that when people come to work early in their careers, they're filled with passion. They're filled with, hey, this is why I'm, you know, teaching, you know, second graders. I think what happens over time as you move in Denver Public Schools from teaching second grade to here to here to here, that passion gets sucked away. Yeah. And you become some leadership jerk. <laughs> and it's just like strategy and numbers. And the passion that brought you there early is gone. Yeah. And that's what I, that's what I, you know, I, I, with Jeff Davis, until, well, with, with um, Sandy, until every child as well. That is like, I can barely say that without, coming, without crying. Yeah. That's it. It's not complicated. What I think is modestly complicated is to go from until every child as well, or we're here to keep astronauts safe in space, yeah. the world's greatest container corporation, to be relentless with your senior team 
and then connect that to the culture of your organization. So from the, this level down to the very lowest level of Moleskine or the very lowest level of Children's Hospital, people are on fire. And by the way, the reason I know Sandy Fenwick is as good as she is, yeah. is when I was teaching the Program for Leadership Development, PLD, she, had a, she sent a bunch of physicians to my program. And when I was teaching with them, the first thing out of their mouths was, until every child is well. That to me is data. Whoever they're working for has got it because you got four or five different physicians in different programs saying the same thing. Yeah. There's something about her ability to go from talk to action at the lowest levels of Children's Hospital that is beautiful. So again, I, I don't want our listeners to think about this as super complicated. I want them to think it as actually super basic. Yeah. But, but people frequently lose it as they go up in their organizations. Yeah, you know, and to unpack that, you know, I, I love the examples because to unpack that, what you are doing is capturing sort of this passion in a sentence, keep astronauts safe in space yes. until every child is healed or yes. is well. cured as well. And, and what you are doing is tapping into people's passion and what you're also doing is tapping into this idea that that over that statement of passion is not speaking to what you've done or what you're going to do it's speaking to both right. that seems really important here right. that keeping right. every until every child is well keeping astronauts safe in space is being able to encompass both the old yeah. and the new so that, unpack for us that idea important. the importance of the overarching idea of of identity yeah. that, right? that's it's why this issue of, of identity is so important because it raises you know at children's hospital before sandy it was we're a great research hospital yeah and the world's best research in in you know cardiology and pulmonology and covid is done at children's hospital yeah and Sandy said no we're not here to do research when a kid comes into this hospital we come together across disciplines to fix this kid. Now, by the way, the kid may die, but we're gonna learn, we're gonna learn. Yeah. So it's not about the research, the silos of the research, it's about coming together as a community so this kid gets well. Yeah. So I, I think the, the importance of identity is it's modestly abstract and it's filled with passion and it provides the overarching narrative that permits, hey, we have to do great research and we have to get this kid well. Yeah. We have to do old fashioned heliophysics and we have to do open distributed peer research, which is completely counter normative to me as a professional yeah. until something clicks in my head and say, Hey, wow, this is not threatening. This is actually a compliment. And I think yeah. the beauty of passion is it takes what can be seen as a competence destroying threat and makes it into yeah. an asset to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I um, saw a comment pop up in the chat from Tara Simpson. So Tara, it's nice to have you here. Tara is a, an alum of our executive forum, the Women's uh, Leadership Forum, and is at BB Hospital. And her comment was about how the identity at BB around change has helped them advance and move quickly. So help us unpack. Yeah. So to be fair, Boston Children's Hospital is not an identity around change. It's right. an overarching identity that enables change. So help us unpack oh. that a little bit, how it allows for this rapid change. Yeah, because, because in order to explore, particularly in this world of COVID, you need lots of experiments. Yeah. And most of these experiments are not going to work. Yeah. Most of them are going to fail at <laughs> this time. And if, and, and the, you get permission to do that when we're here at Denver Public Schools around some aspiration. I, I don't remember what Tom Bosberg's vision was, but it's something about magnificent education for these kids. And partly we have to improve old fashioned teaching because yeah. we've got to do that. So the schools are really not below, below par and we have to experiment. And that, that notion, that overarching identity permits provides air cover, provides a justification, provides a narrative for our experiments. Yeah. And I think we're in a world where we must experiment. 
And, and if, if there's no overarching, I mean, if we have to simply do great advertising, they will never experiment with crowdsourced content. Yeah. So yeah. it's some notion of we're doing creativity for the future, old and new. It permits both to, both to flourish. Yeah. And, you know, it's not... So somebody in the chat also noted that like until every child as well is like, n that's not achievable. It's aspirational. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, we, we worked on really clearly trying to articulate a very specific identity for the women's leadership initiative and getting down to that boiled down statement. That's both integrative and, and um, impassioned is not always, it, you know, it, it's simple, but not always easy to get there. And it's not an achievable statement. Right. Can, can you speak to that? Like why? So is that frustrating for some people or is that aspirational? Like how do we think about until every child is well as valued, even if we know it's right. asymptotic, we're never fully getting there. Yeah, totally. And that I, I actually pushed uh, Sandy on that because not every child is going to be well. Yeah. And, and that's real. And her response was, that's, that is for sure. And we're going to figure out why that child died. And that's part of our research agenda at Children's Hospital. Yeah. But it's this aspiration that is really key. It's an unattainable. I, I first did this work with Paul O'Neill many years ago at Alcoa. I, I saw, I saw him called highest quality, lowest cost aluminum company. Yeah. And that's like totally, oh, oh by the way, with safety was his, like a big deal, like no fatalities. That's impossible in the aluminum industry, but that's an aspiration he wanted to live into. Yeah. And so we had this highly efficient machine and they were figuring out completely different ways of doing aluminum that were more safe. Yeah. You know, I want to invite into the chat. Uh, we've had a bunch of comments in chat about how people are experiencing this in their own organizations. I want to invite into the chat any of you that feel like you are either living in at your organizational level, an identity, a statement of purpose, a value statement that really is integrative, encompassing, impassioned, and can bring in the value of innovation and what that looks like. So, and, and at the same time, Mike, you know, one of the things that I have experienced in, I guess I could say being indoctrinated in the world of ambidexterity and thinking about this as paradox is that, you know, I often think about this at a personal level, right? Mm -hmm. What does it look like to have an overarching identity of where I want to go mm -hmm. and thinking about that as what it means for me to be personally learning from where I've been mm -hmm. and innovating where I want to go? Right. You know, I'm curious what you think about that, right? Like my own personal ambidexterity. Yeah, I, I, would, I would defer to Wendy Smith on that yeah. one. <laughs> and Ella. Um, yeah. but, but, but I do think, I do think we are all, um, you know, when we do our research, we're in a world of exploration. Yeah. And yeah. when we're doing our teaching, for the most part, we're like, we're not experimenting. We've got something that works. And we get better and better and better. So I think personally, many of us are in this world of explore and exploit, but that, that paradoxical mindset, the work you've done with senior teams, owning that and how they deal with it personally and with the team, I think I'd rather hear from you, frankly, than from me. Yeah, before I do, I just want to raise up a couple comments in the chat. Wendy uh, Scott from Blue Blaze and a friend of ours has talked about this aspirational identity of both strong brand identity and the ability to innovate for the future. So allowing that brand identity to morph. Sheila Erlerbaum has put in the comment about being able to provide service, the best possible service you can, even if you haven't, aren't able to solve everybody's challenges and really dealing with those. And those do speak to what we're talking about, about being paradoxical, right. which is to be able to hold that this identity is overarching and to be able to hold these competing demands mean you have to live in not an either or mindset, but really live in a both and mindset. Yes. You know, I, I do want to uh, bring forward uh, the work that I've done. I've done with Ella, uh, what we'll share with Ella, which is that this paradoxical mindset is about saying, today and tomorrow isn't an either or, or uh, what you were noting before that explore exploit isn't an either or, that it's not, that the identity allows us to not see these things as necessarily in conflict, even though they rub up against each other and you have to make decisions about resources. 
that it's a both and in the big picture. It helps us sort of advance this idea that it's really a both and in the big picture and we've got to do both going forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and it clashes, you were mentioning earlier, it clashes with individual identity. And that's maybe, yeah. you know, the work that Hila did at NASA and the work we're doing at a large consulting firm, not change logic, everybody, at a large consulting firm, is, is when you ask consultants to use the crowd, or when you ask scientists to use the crowd, that's a professional slap in the face. And if it's coded as a slap in the face or an insult, I'm simply not going to do it. Right. That's like the role of a leader is to say, hey, wait a minute. Your old fashioned way of doing consulting is super important and is really great. And this is a compliment to you. Yeah. Using the crowd, don't treat it as a substitute. Treat it as a compliment. Yeah. That, that being able to own that inconsistency, own that tension, own that paradox is a really important senior skill. And at the end of the day, in executing ambidexterity, that is the crucial resource, is having leaders who can live into conflict, who can live into tension. And I've got a bunch of examples of those who came really close, who couldn't do it, and it, and it failed. That's the real secret sauce, is leadership, senior teams, and owning that contradiction. Yeah, and... Um... You know, one of the things that this raises, it's, it, there's an emotional piece, right? That when we see a both and, we tend to feel defensive, that that defensiveness of I'm not getting my side advanced as opposed to opportunistic, which is your point yeah. about expanding. Someone in the chat said, how, you know, can we expand on both and and integrative? A key part of this is really recognizing our defensiveness that we feel threatened maybe by the uncertainty or the novelty and yeah. that the old world is not being threatened it's being brought into the new world there's a yeah. huge emotional component to this yeah yeah but again that old world may be right yeah like it may well be that our face-to-face -face happy world in universities is going to drop like a rock that, that yeah. may may be and we've got to figure it out. And the best fir firms, or the best organizations, the best schools, best universities, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Mike, it's amazing. I'm looking at the time. Someone in the chat said this could go, you know, they could listen for another half hour or much longer. I, we could engage for another half an hour or much longer. And there's so many more questions. I want to um, just spend a minute before we sign off around this idea that of, of your, your initial comment about how on some level there's a senior team responsibility of crafting this overarching identity. And yet we all, wherever we sit in the organization, you as the middle manager of AMP or others, have a role to play in advancing this identity, advancing this both and being ambidextrous. Can you just speak? I, I, I know a number of our leaders on the call today are sitting in that role of having people that report to them and yet you know, not crafting the identity at the senior level. Can you speak to that briefly before we sign off? Yeah, I think if, if you're a middle level leader in an advertising agency or you're a principal of, let's say you're a principal of a school and there are other principals and there's a superintendent, the extent to which you've got this magnificent identity for your school and you don't get support from your peers and your superintendent, partly you're going you're gonna to live in a frustrated world. Yeah. Unless you can manage up and get that superintendent and a coalition of your peers to live into this more broad identity for your high school. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think f for a middle level leader, and I'm, I'm blessed because my leader, if you will, the dean, kind of definitely gets this. But if he or she didn't, my job would be to sort of manage up it would be to help the dean say hey we have to explore we're going to make mistakes we're going to we're not going to hurt the brand because all you worry about the brand we're going to explore and we're going to continue so it's partly managing up and if you cannot and i know many of you are dealing with leaders who are um, not willing to hear this then you're in a world of frustration yeah yeah, and I think, you know, one thing that I found helpful, uh, both in your work and seeing you interact with senior leaders and my own work in senior leaders, is that simply labeling these things, being yeah. able to articulate yeah. 
the old and the new, the explore and exploit, the need to do both, the ambidexterity of it, even just using the language of both and and paradox yeah. helps people realize the value of that. Yeah, let me do one, let me take that one, one more step. Yeah. The beauty of academics, our role as academics is to know things, but we don't particularly do things. I mean, our job is to do research. Yeah. Yeah. And we're dealing with clients or people are dealing in, in, in the room or on, online here who have to know and do. Yeah. I think that ideas of paradox, of inconsistency, of senior teams, of structure are pretty straightforward. The doing of it yeah. is really difficult. Yeah. And the role of a great helper, a great colleague is to take that senior team and increase their capacity to act in a world of contradiction and paradox. Yeah. And my experience is that leaders get up to that point and frequently see, oh my God, I gotta deal with conflict, I gotta deal with tension, I gotta deal with all these contradictions, and they step back. Yeah. And the role of academics and the role of great consulting firms is to help these leaders take action to live into that paradox. And that is, just hard to do for the leader by himself or by herself. Yeah, and again, um, we could continue to talk about this for hours. I will say that what we will put into the notes as we send them out as an email is um, some work that Ella and I did on a paradox mindset measure. Where yeah. do people stand on being able to hold paradox? We see this as a developed skill that it's something that, may, that we may have competencies for now, and it's something that we can develop going forward. So we'll put that into the chat. Uh, I am uh, paradoxically so thrilled at this conversation and sad to say we have to sign off at this moment. So Mike, any last thoughts before we sign off? It's never been more important to step into this world of leadership in uncertainty as now. This is the time for you, for leaders out there to live into what it means to be a leader. Yeah. So all the best. Yeah, absolutely. So I, Mike, thank you so much. It is always, I mean, I have had the pleasure of learning from and with you over the years. I'm so thrilled to share that with a broader community here. So thank you. You're welcome, Wendy. Great, yeah. to, great to work with you all. Yeah, and thank you to all of you in the chat for continuing an ongoing conversation. We have both had a conversation here, Mike, between you and I, and a really robust conversation happen, happening between this broader community that we will share. I've seen some comments of people saying they'd love to watch this again because the ideas are so valuable, profound, and need some time to sink in. So that will indeed be up on our website in a couple of days. We'll let you know when it's up. But Mike, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, in this session. I will uh, just sign off um, here. And again, uh, say thank you to you all for being here, being in community with us. Please do continue to join us in the Women's Leadership Initiative community. We have one more webinar like this and we will continue to be in conversation with all of you through our various channels, developing and trying to figure out how we explore and exploit in our own initiative to continue to connect community and bring content your way. So thank you all. It's been a pleasure to be in this conversation today.